Howdy, howdy, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Welcome to Russia, inside Russia. My name is Konstantin, and I am live back uh, after missing a few days um, due to some rather pleasant reasons, but later about that. I am so glad to be back and to stream again. I have a couple, well, one big message for you. I hope you find it valuable. And without uh, further ado, let's jump right into it. I'm going to tell you about Russian space program or Russia's space exploration program or, uh, well, Russia's space. <laughs> Um, my friends, this is a very sad topic. I would like, well, before I jump into the space, uh, I would like to share a very important news about Russia's car manufacturing industry. It's connected directly to the space program, and I will tell you how at the very end of the message. Russian car making, car manufacturing industry isn't that large. Most cars that are sold or were sold in Russia were foreign made, imported. Most companies that, that were selling cars to Russia were German, South Korean, and Japanese. I think American cars car manufacturers were on the fourth place i'm not sure anyway um, russia has the remnants of once quite large car manufacturing industry very few car manufacturers left and among the biggest ones are after us uh, infamous ladas gas um, a large manufacturing plant located in Nizhny Novgorod, and it manufactures little vans, uh, Gazelle, and Kamaz, large trucks. Well, all large manufacturers have announced that they are, well, they have been cutting down on the manufacturing of cars. Due to a few reasons, and most important reasons were since February 24th of 2022, the logistics for the car Russian car manufacturers have gone to hell. Uh, lots of companies d have decided to stop selling components to Russia, and it turned out that to uh, quite a surprise to some of us that Russian cars include very many parts that are imported, including all semiconductors, all uh, electronics, and so forth. So basically, without those parts, Russian car, ma car manufacturers cannot produce cars. Um, right now, uh, one of the plants has sent all the workers to a two-week vacation. Another plant has got the work week, but it's four instead of five. And the third plant is experiencing tremendous problems, not manufacturing any trucks. That's important, and you will understand why at the end of the message. Now to the space program, space... I don't even know how to call it. Space exploration, space wonder space space something anyway um russia was always number one in space the champion the pioneer the first man-made object in space was sputnik some of you might even remember that 1957, that was Russia. 
Another milestone, first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, 1961, Russia. Another milestone, spacewalk, Evgeny Leonov, man in open space, outside of the ship, um, 1970. Then there was a flight with, uh, with the Americans, Soyuz Apollo. Then there was a moon, um, how do you call this, moon hovering craft, moon craft. Um, then there was a space shuttle. The space shuttle wasn't the first, but there was a Soviet space shuttle. It's safe to say that Russia, Soviet Union, was always number one. With few exceptions, the Americans were very close, uh, trailing behind. Um, man in space in the United States was sent weeks after Russia, I think. Um, of course, Americans were <laughs> the only people on the moon, and America had fantastic moon program. Somehow it was terminated. Then, of course, there was space shuttle program. And, um, you know, that was pretty amazing as well. Russia was catching up, and then finally it caught up in 1988. Well, I would like to take... So, you want, uh, for you to understand Russia's space program better, I want to take you a few steps, well, a few years, a few decades back to 1942. Um, I didn't know, and not too many people know, that both Soviet and American space programs have roots in Germany. That's right, Germans were the first ones. <laughs> they didn't quite make it to the space, but they created, they were the pioneers of uh, the techn uh, discovering technologies that a couple decades decades later propelled people into space. Um, I believe in early 40s, uh, Germany decided to develop new type of weapon, rockets that could fly really, really high and really far to deliver payloads to, you know, other countries. And... <clears throat> You know, Germans are the best engineers in the world, and they started developing this pro pro project, uh, this technology. Um, and they actually succeeded. They did a fantastic job. There was a team of brilliant engineers. It was led by Werner von Braun. And they, des they designed um, an able rocket. And... They were actually very close to using it in 1943 or 1944. And if they finished, if they designed it sooner, then we don't know how World War II uh, would have ended. Because that was a mighty, powerful weapon for the time. Breakthrough, okay? And thank goodness that the Germans did not finish what they started. But <laughs> they went very far. The product that they designed, the rocket, was called V2. F-A-U-2. And it could fly real high, <laughs> real far, and it could uh, deliver payload. The Germans designed, you know, the chases, the engine, the navigation system, um radio location system, and so forth. But then, you know, the end of World War II happened, and both Russian Soviets and Americans, they decided to take uh, the fruits, so to speak, of the German work. And ge geographically, the Russians and the Germans... Uh, I'm sorry, the Americans, they were attacking Germany from different sides. You know, the Germans from from uh, northwest, Normandy, and the Russians from the east. So the Russians took Berlin, and um, the Americans took the West Germany. 
Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm being very thorough because it's important. Now, Russians got their hands on lots of technologies and one of the teams that was developing the engine for the rocket. Uh, the, the, the one of the centers was located in Berlin, was in the hands of the Soviets, and another center was located in the northwest, in the island of Penemünde. Um, Werner, Werner von, von Braun and his um, deputy engineers were located in Penemünde. And all subcontractors, very, very um, famous and known companies, even today, such as Iga Farben, um, that's, that company doesn't exist, but it was broken into pieces, Siemens uh, and the likes, they developed different technologies and they subcontracted. So, and the Russians got their hands on those technologies. But the team that was stationed at Penemunde and worked at Penemunde, they actually decided to uh, turn themselves in into the hands of Americans because they didn't want to go to Russia. They thought that the Russians are not Christian and they'd rather surrender to the Americans, which they did, and they were brought into the United States. I don't remember where. But the United States decided to use the technologies developed by Werner von Braun, and they made it. Uh, they made him the head of the agency that was called NASA. The, the Russians also started their own space agency, and they took the technologies and some Germany into Russia, and they decided to make um, a little spaceport for the testing, well, not spaceport, but rocket port, so to speak, rocking, rocket taste and range. range. It was called Babi Yar. And um, this is where the first, the roots of Soviet um, space program started. They basically started developing further onto what Germans had done before. The Ru both Russians and Americans were competing against one another, and against each other, and they needed rockets that could fly far and higher. And um, basically that's the roots of the space programs of both countries. And Russians excelled. Smart engineers, they built from, not from scratch, but from the German technologies, and they designed a brilliant rocket engine, it was called RD-1, um, this is very basic technology that was the base of V2, V2 rocket, and it's basically still the very core technology of the space engines that the Russians have been using for the past 70 years. And then the space, space race started in late 50s when the Russians launched Sputnik, and Americans tried to catch up, and, you know, they were very close, they got ahead in some instances, and so forth. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is that Russia had a marvelous thing that was an absolute beacon for humanity. The United States was not far behind, but it was right there. Um, the Soviet Union had f something absolutely brand new for humanity, okay? It sent things and people into space. Hundreds of thousands of years before, human beings could not dream of things like that. They didn't, couldn't even understand. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, people, engineers in the Soviet Union, they were sending things and people into space. That was something that Soviet people were so proud of. That was one of the um, proofs that the Soviet Union was number one, was the best, the most fair social system there is. That's what they were telling us, they were selling us. That's, most of us were indoctrinated into this thing. I was indoctrinated in this, into this philosophy. When I was a kid, when I was growing up, 
um, you know, when they tell you hundreds of times that you live in the best country in the world and this is the freest society and then this and that, you start believing, especially when you, if you're a kid, especially when they give you proofs of that. They say, hey, this is the space program. We're number one because it shows, it proves that look what we can go, we, we can do. Look how far we can go when we work together, when our society is fair, when communism is and works, and so forth. You know, look how marvelous everything is. Look what a fantastic country you live in. Space, the space program. I mean, we're sending people to space left and right, and we're going to send them to moon, to Mars, and so forth. And we we'll already send our, our um, spaceships to Mars and to Mars. <laughs> And you go, wow, this is, this is insane. This is true, you know. Yes, this is the proof. The proof you can, you can see with your own eyes. Yes, we do send people to space, you know. Uh, anyway, I was so proud when I was growing up that Soviet Union had, was number one in space. I was, it, was, it was really hard to explain right now to you. Uh, all of us were. It, it, was, it was one of those things that just we would give up everything just to be number one in space sports you know the propaganda was a job let me tell you two questions well one one question i was asking when i was a kid i was asking this why americans are number one why do they have shuttles that can go back and forth and we have one time only uh rockets that you can send and that's it we're behind why we're we're so great in space and then comes 1988 and russian space shuttle called buran is sent to space and it travels and lands safely you know comes back and we go wow that's fun finally finally we're number one again you know but the year is 1988, and it's a little too late because I'm already 12 years old, and I already uh, know things. I understand things. I can compare, and I can think somewhat critical at that age. And I start asking questions. And um, the picture that is in front of my eyes, real life, is quite different from the picture that is uh, given us from TV, from the radio, from the you know official. Uh, communists and so forth and we start asking questions so um, we can forget about Buran that was not that important any longer but <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that um, Russia had something absolutely fantastic done and you know there's no way around it Yes, Russia was number one in space. When Russia Soviet Union fell apart and in nineteen ninety one new government, you know, new paradigm, new philosophy, new everything, we had we were so full of hopes, we were so full of optimism, and you know, in the first years everything started working out. One of the Biggest proofs of, proofs of that was the International Space Station. Finally, we were not competing against the Americans. Finally, we were working together with NASA. Finally, it was unbelievable. Americans, everything connected with space was so top secret in the USSR. And all of a sudden, Americans come and they're let into the factories, into the space center near Moscow, into the Baikonur spaceport, you know, the whole nine yards. They have access, and they invite our um, astronauts to, cosmonauts to fly their ships. They show their technology. And we invite their astronauts to fly with us. That was just an insane, you know, it was so great. We launch... In, in international, the International Space Station. And that was the, the highest of this optimism. 
I personally was thinking, hey, there is no limit of what we can do combined, you know, combining our knowledge with the knowledge of people from other countries. There's such a synergy born that is just absolutely unbelievable. We can go, I don't know, Mars? Oh, forget it. We can go even farther than that. Mid-90s. I don't know if you recall that, but there was a time of great hope, great optimism, great, fantastic mood, you know. So, uh, unfortunately, International Space Station was the highest of Russian uh, space program because from it started going downwards. Um... I don't really know what happened. I don't want to believe that people in the space program, the officials, they were corrupt. I don't want to believe that they were stealing money. I don't I don't want to believe that because you know it would be really painful. Um let's just suppose that they simply um started working not as hard or they, 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 you know, perhaps the best brains went to the United States or other countries. The competition emerged. The Indians went into space. The Chinese went into space. The Europeans formed their own international, uh, European um, space program. And, um, you know, people started flying to space more and more and Russians started flying less and less. Russians still had a monopoly on um sending large payloads into space because of that fantastic rd technology that we designed in the 50s with help of german engineers um, i'm not making this up i read the books i did some research if you're interested uh in learning how the russian soviet space the space program was born and developed read the book, a great book by Boris Chertok, who was number one person in Russia's space program for genera- decades after Sergei Karolev died. And, you know, he wrote a book in 1998. He basically, you know, told everything, how they started and, uh, you know, how they used the help of German engineers and so forth. Uh, the book is called The People and the Rockets. Fantastic read. So, um, things started getting worse. Russia still used the technology, fantastic technology of RD space engines. Americans used to buy them, as far as I understand. And they just recently, NASA, very recently, uh, designed its own engine for high payloads to send to space. And of course, you know, later Elon Musk did the revolution. He was the first uh, person whose company would send um, a spaceship, a very simple spaceship, very cheap spaceship compared to the Russian, you know, ones and American ones or NASA ones. Um, And that, I think that's changed everything. We're just seeing the beginning of the new era of space exploration. So it's not just the governments and the government sponsored programs, it's private companies sending people to space. Uh, Jeff Bezos followed, you know, we're seeing something incredible. And recently, Russian space program has taken quite a few hits. Uh, The rockets would simply blow up. The Sputniks, uh, satellites, they would malfunction. Uh, Lots of, uh, quite a few cases of failed launches and failed deliveries of Sputniks, commercial deliveries to the orbit, uh, resulted in huge financial loss. And as a, a guarantor of you know, Russian space agency Roscosmos would, you know, pick up the bill, so to speak. And the guy who was the head of uh, Roscosmos for quite a few years, um, he, I 
can't really remember of him for anything, but he created great memes, uh, memes like like you know he would send all over internet, and uh, he was always trying to pick up Twitter fights with Elon Musk. Okay, he would tweet something to Musk, uh, like inviting him to for the answer, and I'm, we're all laughing about that. Okay. So Vladimir Putin finally fired him, and uh, his name was Ragozin. The last name was Ragozin, and there's a new guy. Uh, this guy is the new head of Rof Borisov. He was appointed a few days ago, a week or so, and just recently, about 12 hours ago, he gave an interview to a Russian channel saying that... Um, Russian space program is in trouble, basically. It's far behind the European, the Americans, the, you know, even, even the Chinese. Uh, Chinese in space ahead of Russians. Oh, my God. It's crazy. What have we come to? Anyway, the plans, of course, are absolutely fantastic. That's what they're telling us. Um, but... <laughs> The reason why I decided to tell you this is because Russians, well, Roscosmos is the head of the new head of Roscosmos. He was talking to Vladimir Putin, and he announced that Russia is pulling off International Space Station. And there is a good opportunity that Russian part of International Space Station will remain intact. So Russia will not tear it apart and will not take it its module and drown it somewhere in the ocean, okay? Why would they do that in the first place? I think that would be absolutely crazy thing, but um, beyond 2020, it's announced that Russia will not be a part of ISS. This is the end, in my opinion. This is the crush of the dreams that we had in mid-90s, early 90s, when we were thinking about this new era came to our lives, when everything in the future was going to be absolutely fantastic, trouble-free, um, cloudless, you know. Space was just one of the things that we could do together, have a synergy at, you know. And now... Uh, that, that the first early bird of that new era was the creation of International Space Station. And now, 20 years later, um, that's it. Announcement that that era of great hopes in space for Russia, in technology, in high tech, uh, is over. Of course, Vladimir Putin back in April announced that Russia is renewing the <laughs> moon program. <laughs> I haven't heard anything since April. I mean, if you announce moon program, you got to come up with a plan. And the plan would be something like this, you know. In 2022, we will have a roadmap. In 2023, we will start working on the modules. In 24, we will have the first test flight or something like that, you know. Um, let it be a program for next 20 years, but they got to be a plan. They got to they gotta have something to show us, okay? So far, we haven't seen anything. So far, you know, just words. And the next thing, July 2022, Russia quits ISS. To me, that's huge. To me, that's very sad. To me, that's very painful. To me, it says that... Um, that huge, huge part of my life that I was very proud about in my past is over. Um, of course, Russians announced, uh, this guy, the head of Roscosmos, announced that Russia will design, build, and send to space its own orbital station. There are two things I don't understand about that. First, why? Why? Why does Russia need own orbital space station? If Russian program right now, currently, is close to non-existent, why do we need our own 
International, uh, our own uh, um, space station. Why can't we continue working together with the Americans, with the Europeans, furthering and bettering the ISS? Why can't we do that? That's question number one. And question number two, remember how I started my message today? Telling you the not so good news about Russian car manufacturing industry. Well, my friends, it takes much more to produce space rockets, send them into space safely, and do space exploration rather than making cars. Making cars is not rocket science. Science Making cars is, is relatively easy, cheap, compared to sending people into space, exploring moon and other solar system planets. You know, making cars is peanuts. But how can we, Russians, send new, build and send new spaceships into space if we can't even produce the components to make our own domestic cars? And that is the question that I have no answer. Perhaps you will give me the answer in the comments. I would love to hear your opinion in your comments. And this has been my message. And this is a quite sad message for me personally. Because I still remember that feeling of pride. That feeling of feeling of feeling proud <laughs> of what my country was doing into, in space. And I have a completely different feeling right now. Well, it's life. It's 2022, you know. Thank you so much. It's really good to stream again. Um, I hope to go back to streaming daily starting Wednesday in a few short days. I'm about to turn on the comments. Again, I would like to hear your opinion in my message today and you know, I'd love to answer your questions. Um, I have wonderful mods backing me up today. We have Lorna, Mommy, and Bob S. And a new bot, a space technology kind of stuff. It's called Nightbot. It's an automatic. It's an algorithm. Uh, so please be nice to him. Or not nice. It's up to you. <laughs> but he doesn't care. It doesn't care, you know. It just, um, it's programmed to do certain things. Uh, please, no obscene language. Uh, be respectful to one another. Um, use common sense before posting something. Don't use blacklisted words. I think you're going to find out what they are very fairly soon. Um, let's do it. Thank you so much. Turn in the comments on. This is Dasha's room, by the way. I kicked her out, well, in a good way. I sent her to uh, our room, so she's spending time with mom and brother. <laughs> uh, Lorna is number one today, and mommy is very close, the second one. Well, the third one, Toroid Star is the second one. Great to see you, my friends. Thank you very much for joining. We have the usual suspects today. Ramakers, Reese Gray, Bruce, Tim, Rob, born in the USA. Uh, I think it's a fresh face. Greetings, Faith, N, Rain, Jorg, 
Marsha Ryan, Parmela J, Noob Comment, Thomas. Um, my friends, uh, so many, the usual suspects. Welcome, thank you so much for coming. I missed you, I missed streaming. Very strange feeling when you stream every single day for months and months and then all of a sudden you stop and take a few days off. Uh, I'd rather be streaming, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> okay, we have a few super chats, thank you so much. Reese Gray, uh, you're number one again. Hello from Canada, Mr. Popular. You know, Reese, it's so good to uh, read your first part of the message. You know, hello from Canada, Mr. Popular. I must have read it, I don't know, 120 times, but uh, thank you so much. It's, it's uplifting. It's good to see you again. Likewise, I hope your vacation has gone well. So far, so good. Um, very physically demanding because we move a lot. We do a couple sites every single day plus we on top of that we we want to um, hit the beaches as much as we can uh, and go swimming uh, so it's really it's always on the move so physically i'm not really <laughs> uh you know just laying on the beach and then doing nothing for a week um, i'm pretty tired but you know mentally it's much much better than than uh, you know, then uh, it's, it feels like I've, okay. Uh, if sanctions on Russia continue, I think it would be impossible for it to continue its space program. Reese, well, uh, I must have uh, failed to deliver the message. It's already impossible right now. Basta. Noob comment, uh, howdy howdy, great to see.